Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we're going to build a piece of arts and crafts furniture called a Morris chair, named after the arts and crafts designer William Morris. We found an antique original in an antique shop in Tucson, Arizona. I'll take you there next and we'll come back to the shop and build the chair. There are a lot of reasons to come to Tucson. The Mexican food is great, the mountain views are spectacular, and the weather is sublime. But there's another reason. Down in the artist district, there's a bunch of small specialty shops, like this one, F.L. Wright Gallery, that specializes in American arts and crafts furniture. Look at this piece. This is a Gustav Stickley original, a table made out of chestnut. And one of the interesting features is this arched stretcher and of course the classic through tenon. Now among the originals there are the factory made pieces like this rocker, a spindleback rocker that you could buy in 1910 for only eight dollars. The place is just filled with great pieces. The one I wanted to show you is this one over here. This was actually made by L and J.G. Stickley, Gustav's younger brothers. And in fact their factory just reopened back in the 1980s. This is their version of the Morris chair, which came out of the arts and crafts movement in England. It's a beautiful piece, made out of white oak. It has this through tenon detail, a corbel to support the armrest. The side is enclosed with these thin slats that are mortised into the armrest and the rails. If I move this cushion out of the way, you can see the back. It actually adjusts. It pivots on these wooden pegs. It has curved slats, and the adjustment mechanism couldn't be simpler. No metal, just a piece of wood with a square mortise that fits over a peg for the full upright position, in between, and fully reclined or snooze. Now, this one's been reupholstered with leather. Originals were often made with leather and tapestry. I can tell you this, it's comfortable. I don't think Eric would mind if I measured it up. Well, I got lucky. After seeing the antique chair in Tucson, I knew that I needed some good oak for this project. My local supplier had some beautiful quarter sawn white oak. The piece already looks 100 years old, and it'll look even better once we put the finish on it. I want to get started today by working on the part of the project that takes the most time. That's these curved backrest slats. This is not a single piece of wood, it's actually a lamination of two thin pieces. I suppose you could cut these, these slats out of a solid piece of wood, but that would be very wasteful and it wouldn't be a very stable piece. A better way is to take a piece of wood, split it down the middle, and then glue it up on a curved form. The best way to split the wood is to use this resaw. But before I use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these, safety glasses, and of course, hearing protection when necessary. Now the advantage of the resaw is that it has a very wide and thin blade that can cut through pieces of wood that are up to 12 inches high unlike the table saw, which really can only cut wood that's about two and a half inches high. I've set my rip fence to cut these pieces right down the middle. We'll just run them through. The surface planer takes out all the saw marks it gives me pieces that are uniform in thickness. Here's the bending form, a piece of four by four that I've cut an arch in. There's a couple layout lines at each end, which would be the shoulders of the backrest slat. If I take a straight edge and connect those two points, you can see the amount of deflection in the middle, about an inch. A little more than I want in the end because there will be some spring back when I take the pieces out of the form. 
The glue that I'm using is a polyurethane glue. It actually cures in the presence of moisture. I'll apply glue to one side, water to the mating piece, and clamp them up. This glue will take about 24 hours to cure. So tomorrow at this time, we'll be able to remove the pieces from the clamps. The next thing to work on are the legs. The two front legs are mirror images of each other. And they require mortises for this front stretcher and the side stretcher. The rear legs are also mirror images of each other, except the mortise for the back stretcher has to be longer because the stretcher is wider. To make the mortises, I'm using my designated mortiser. I've laid out each leg for the location of the mortises. I've set up the mortiser with a 3 8 inch chisel. It's just a matter of plowing them out. The next operation is to make a tenon at the top of each leg. The tenon comes all the way through the armrest. This detail is classic of craftsman style furniture. Normally I would make the mortise first and fit the tenon, but in this case I'm gonna reverse the order. So I've set up my table saw to make the shoulder cuts first. Using my tenoning jig, I'm able to hold the piece securely while I make the cheek cuts. That's all there is to it. Now I'm forming tenons on the ends of the stretchers. I've already made the shoulder cuts on each face. I'm just raising the blade slightly to make the shoulder cut at each edge. My band saw with a fence allows me to complete the top and bottom of each tenon, something my tenoning jig can't do. And that completes the tenons on our stretchers. Let's take another look at our prototype. The sides of the chair are closed in with these thin slats. The slats have tenons on each end that fit into mortises in the stretcher and into the armrest. To make those mortises, I've replaced my 3 8 inch chisel with a quarter inch chisel, and I've clamped on an auxiliary fence to help me hold the stretcher vertical as I make the mortise. Here I've just made a rabbit by making two passes through the table saw in the front stretcher of our chair. Now I just want to dry fit all the pieces together and then we'll be able to start working on the armrest. That's good. So over here I have one of the blanks for the armrest and a full size pattern. The first thing I want to do is make the through mortises for the legs. The mortise that I need for those legs is larger than my largest chisel for the mortising machine, which is a half inch square. So I'll have to make a couple adjustments to the fence until I get the whole area cleaned out. Okay, now that's pretty good. I'll have to fine tune the fit with a chisel. Let me show you this next feature on the armrest. There are three pegs at the back of each armrest, and they hold this cleat, which gives us the backrest adjustment. I need three half-inch mortises for those. These narrow mortises in the underside of the armrest are for those side slats, and they correspond with the ones I made earlier in the stretchers. Okay, that's one. Now I'm ready to make these side slats. I start out with oak that's been planed down to 7 16 of an inch thick. 
I've set up my stack dado head cutter and this sacrificial fence to make the tenons. This way, one operation makes the shoulder cut and the cheek cut. After raising my dado head blade just a little bit, I'm able to complete these edges of each tenon. I want to remove the sharp edges of the slats. To do that, I'm using an OG bit in my router table. I'm not using the whole bit, I'm just using the very tight radius area. Here I've managed to dry fit all the pieces I've made so far, and everything fits pretty good. Now I want to mark the amount of the tenon that sticks above the armrest so that when I round over the top, I don't take off too much material. Then I'll break everything apart, round the edges of the legs and the stretches just as I did with these slats, and I'll also round over the edges of the armrest itself. A little bit of sanding, and then I'll be ready to glue it up. Okay, that should be pretty good. I want to stay just above the line a little bit. To ease the edges of my armrest, I'm using just a portion of a quarter inch radius round over bit. Well, good morning. Before you were even up today, I was here at the workshop assembling one of the side sections of our Morris chair. And the hole that I just drilled is this one right here. That receives the pin on which this backrest pivots. With that hole drilled, I'm ready to assemble the other side of the chair. And all I'm really going to do is put some glue in each of the mortises and on the tenons, put it together, and clamp it. I can't tell you enough how important it is to pre-sand all these pieces before the assembly. On a piece like this, it would be very difficult to do it after it's all put together. Well, this is the point where if all my cuts are square and true, Everything is going to fit together perfectly, and the chair will be square. There's one tiny little detail left at this point, and I think it's important. A little bit of the mortise remains because of the rabbit in this front rail. And even though it will be hidden by the cushion, I just want to put a little piece of wood in there to fill that void. The next assembly to work on is this backrest assembly. There are two posts on each side and four curved slats. The slats are joined to the post with a mortise and tenon joint. Let's make the mortises first. The mortise for each slat is a quarter inch wide, centered on the post, three quarters of an inch deep. The slat sat on the form overnight, and when I removed the clamps, you can see that I did get a little bit of spring back, but that's okay. I have exactly the arch that I want. Now I have to clean up these pieces. The first step is to make one edge nice and straight and square, so I'll run it through the joiner. The objective is to keep the piece against the fence as it passes over the cutter head. With one edge nice and straight and true, I can now place that edge against the rip fence and rip the pieces to width. I found the best way is to have the curve down and install a feather board to keep the material tight against the surface as it goes through the saw. And one cleanup pass at the joiner on that freshly sawn edge. The bending form has a dual purpose. I can now use it for layout. I have a center line on each of the slat blanks, and I'm just going to line that up over my center line, make sure it always stays there. Then I can take a square and slide it over to this line, which is equivalent of the shoulders on the tenon, and I'm just going to put a mark right on the top edge of the slat. I also take a piece of three-quarter inch scrap material slide that up against the layout line, 
and mark the length of the tenon. Then I'll transfer those marks all the way around on both ends. I'll just trim the tenons to length here at the miter box. Here I've clamped the two slats together and I'm going to use a dovetailing saw to make a shoulder cut at the top and bottom of each tenon. As far as the depth of this cut, it's a quarter inch, more or less. Before I make the shoulder cuts on the face and on the back, I want to complete the layout of each tenon. I'm just going to use a straight edge. I'm going to run it from saw cut to saw cut and hold it back about a sixteenth of an inch. I want the tenon to be perpendicular to the saw cut that I just made. So mark the face of each tenon. And then to get the thickness correct, I'm just going to take a scrap of quarter inch wood, put it over the line I just made, and mark the back side. To make the shoulder cuts on the face, I want to sight down the edge of the saw so that it's parallel with that cut right on the edge. It's not a very deep cut. It's only a little over a sixteenth of an inch. Just a slightly different clamping setup to cut the back shoulder, but the principle is the same. Now I'm ready to cut the thickness of the tenon, and for that I can use my band saw. I'm actually going to just leave or split the line. I'll fine tune the thickness later. Now once again using that quarter inch strip, I can mark the shoulder cuts at the top and the bottom and complete those. Now it's just a matter of fine tuning the tenon with this little rabbiting plane until I get a perfectly snug fit. And now you can see the advantage of not taking off too much with the saw. Back at the router table using the same OG bit that I used to ease the edges of the other parts, I'm going to knock off the long edges of each backrest post and the outside radius of the slats. To ease the edges on the inside radius of each slat, I'm using the same bit, but I've moved the fence onto the back side of the bit. I've installed this featherboard because as I run the piece through, if it should move away from the fence, it will damage the slat. Also, because of the rotation of the bit, instead of feeding right to left, I'm going to feed left to right. The posts for the backrest have the top and bottom edges rounded over to give them a nice contour. And I'll do that at the drum sander. Next, I need to drill a half-inch hole at the bottom of each backrest post for that pin that the whole assembly is going to pivot on. Well, once again, I spent a fair amount of time sanding all these pieces before moving on to this assembly process. More glue in the mortises and on the tenons. Slip it all together, clamp it up. I'll set this aside to dry and finish up the other bits and pieces. Next, I want to make four corner blocks which support the seat. With one 45 degree cut made, I can mark the long diagonal, which is five and five eighths inches, and make that cut. Now I've just simply nibbled away a notch to fit around each leg. I've pre-drilled holes in the blocks for the screws, and now I'm just applying a little bit more of my high-tech glue. And when I set it in place, I want to pre-drill the hole into the stretcher because this is really hard oak. And I'll just secure everything with a couple screws. Now I want to work on this detail. This piece is known as a corbel and it's classic on arts and crafts furniture. So I've laid out a couple on a piece of this one inch thick white oak and I'll rough them out at the bandsaw. A 
a little bit of glue on the corbel. I'll clamp it in place temporarily and then attach it with a couple screws. Here I have some oak plugs that I cut in a scrap piece and I'm simply going to apply a little bit of glue right on the end of the plug, slip those in place, and then I'll trim them flush and sand them smooth. that hold the adjustable cross piece in place are half inch square oak stock. I've rounded over the top edge and I'm simply going to glue them in place. And that's the mortise that I need to slip the cross piece over those pegs. What I'm doing here is putting a chamfer along the top edges of that cross piece. Well now for the final bit of assembly. A little bit of glue in the holes for the dowel pins. I've slipped the pins through the backrest assembly and I also made these octagon washers. They're about a quarter inch thick and they act as a spacer to keep the backrest from hitting the arms. Now it's just a matter of getting the whole assembly in position and driving the pegs home. That's good. Well, there it is, another Morris chair. All we have to do now is order up some leather cushions and figure out what kind of finish we're going to put on this piece. If you recall, the antique chair that we found in Tucson had sort of a dark honey look to it. I was able to find a Danish oil that has a stain already mixed in it that gives me just about the right color. And also, it really brings out the features in this quarter sawn oak. Look at these rays. Now, I'm going to put one liberal coat on, let it sit for about 30 minutes, apply a second coat, let that sit for about 15 minutes, and then wipe the piece dry. Well, we couldn't make the cushions, so we found a quality upholsterer who made some up for us out of good quality leather. And I'll tell you, it's the perfect final touch. This chair is comfortable. Tongs to finish it. And once this is completed, we have a real double lock standing seam. It's waterproof, windproof, and it's a hundred year roof. Well, Larry sure makes it look easy. The next thing that he's going to do is go back to his shop in Vermont and build us a weather vane. And when that's ready, we'll install the cupola. Well, for the last hour or so, Larry and I have fitted the cupola to the roof and secured it in place. He's installed the finial and the final touch, the weather vane has the This Old House logo and the This Old House lettering on it. Beautiful workmanship, Larry. Thanks. Now, how long is it going to take for it to turn green? It'll be about 20 years. Yeah, it sure is going to be nice. I think so. Thanks for your help. My pleasure. But uh, I've got to admit, this has got to be your ultimate challenge. God, this has been in the wars, this house. What do you reckon about this top?